Okay, next guys I'd like to bring up are the terrible trio, as I call them. Uh, Martin, Loic, and Mark, if you wouldn't mind joining us. Um, I will let you guys talk, uh, talk about yourselves first, and then, and then we'll go into Q&A. But what's interesting is, um, actually, we'll start with you, Martin. Uh, so you've, you've actually created how many? Four companies at this point? Eight, but four in technology. Four in technology. Okay, and the other four? Just quickly, because I don't know about the other four. <laughs> the other four are Urban Capital, that I started uh, when my friends who were squatters in New York were thinking that it was cool to move to Tribeca and Soho and squat, and I said maybe it's cooler to get a permit and turn that into a business. And that was in the early 80s when I was a student. I also started an alternative energy company which is building like 200 million euros worth of wind turbines and solar farms. Uh, I also started a biotech company in the 80s, which is now in Canada selling H tests. Uh, and I can't forget the other one. But the ones that are relevant to <laughs> this is the, the ones the that are relevant to the crowd here in technology are uh, Vietel, which I started in 1990, and I. When I sold it was worth uh, 1.2 billion. I started uh, Jastel, which is the second largest publicly traded telecom operator in Spain. Uh, it's also worth around a billion. Uh, I started Yeah.com, which I sold to Deutsche Telekom for 550 million, but they are, they are now again sold it to Vodafone, like this week for again 500 million. Uh, we invested 38 million. And fun, which is what I'm doing now, which is... Uh, which is going to get sold for at, how much? Uh, well, in the billions. <laughs> no, but, but the, <laughs> the, the... No, I, I think what I wanted to say about serial entrepreneurship, I, 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 I was listening to Stelios and, and, and the fact that being... I used to speak very poorly of, of people who were children of rich parents, <laughs> but now I have four children. <laughs> So, <laughs> so I empathize through my children with Stelios. And uh, no, I, I think that, that in my case, you know, I, I, I really wanted to make money because we were, my dad was a professor, my mother was a teacher, and all I heard when I was growing up was we have no money. So that was an incentive to make money. I also wanted to do well because they threw me out of Argentina and killed my cousin, the fascist government of Videla, and almost killed my father and I. So we were forced to emigrate, so I wanted to prove that it was worth for me to be alive and do something useful. So I, I had, a, let's say, a, something to prove. So I think being a serial entrepreneur. But then somebody else said that an entrepreneur is somebody who can't get a job. And certainly when I was at Columbia University and I would go for a job interview and they would say, how do you see yourself in five years? And I would say, at least as your boss. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I wouldn't get a job, you know? I, I can't understand why, you know? Somebody says that to me, they get a job, you know? <laughs> Uh, somewhere else. <laughs> anyway, anyway uh, I don't know. Okay. Is that, is that That's good. That's a good beginning. <laughs> Luik, tell us a bit about you. Um, so I've given up um, trying to measure the size of my uh, balls with Martin <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> so he beats me. But I still have uh, a few years to go to fight <laughs> back. But I created a few companies, uh, four actually, um, I, I, uh, I don't want to get into those details, but like uh, um, I was, uh, I sold a, an advertising company to BBDO. I sold a, a web, one of the top web hosting company in France to France Telecom. Um, a blog company actually was more like partnering with uh, Six Apart, which became number one worldwide. And the last company is kind, kind of fun. Uh, I spent three months helping a president win. Uh, Sarkozy, <laughs> and, which is like, so I took as a business, and it's very different. <laughs> but uh, I was part of his online campaign and tried to uh, gather a thousand bloggers behind him um, and uh, organize a big conversation around. So um, I'm quite proud of uh, and having you won. seen that. 
<laughs> well, I didn't win. No, I helped. I helped. But uh, it was very interesting to me. So that's a blog post, uh, and I'm also a blogger. That's a blog post I cannot really write, which is like, the, I'd love to write it, but the differences between business and politics, they, it's so different that I'm now back into creating another business. And, you know, so, so you've decided not, not to take any role in the Sarkozy government? Well, that would be very arrogant uh, to me to say, no, I not, did not decide to. No, I mean, I, I just helped. I announced at the beginning I would just take a few months to help my country because I think France needs to go out like a, well, let's not get into politics, but yeah, just one thing. <laughs> get out of lying to people, by, uh, to the young, by telling them they can succeed by working less, for example, is a huge mistake, and that's why... It's been four years, and that's why I decided to, to back him and support him. That's one of the reasons, and I could devote a few times. And I said I would go back to business. But it was very interesting to see how those politicians and behave. They, they are, uh, he's very well surrounded, and he takes the Internet very seriously. So tell us about your, you were talking about how politics and entrepreneurialism are, are different. Tell us about your 10 lessons of what not to do. Yeah, I'll do it, I, I'll do it uh, in, a, in a sentence, but basically um, I'm pretty sure uh, Mark and, and Martin uh, are, are uh, also, and you then, meeting people all the time who ask, you know, young entrepreneur who ask, how can I create a company, you know, tell me how I should do it, and so I do it by reverse, like what you should do to make sure you never create anything. Um, and, and so these are like uh, very simple. First, like wait for the idea of your life. You can wait forever, right? It's like it's not happening this way. And Nicholas said it. It doesn't happen that way. You, you cannot, you know, it's like dream about a revolutionary idea and, and wait. People wait all their lives. So it's just a start doing things. It's only execution that matters. I guess you can take any domain and Stelios has proven it with uh, businesses where everything was done or looked to be done. So that's the first one. Uh, the second one, very strong, is don't share your idea. As, as, as an investor, right, uh, um, you get emails, still today I get everyday emails which are like, and please sign the NDA before, right, uh, and then I send you my business model, it's super secret, be careful, I don't want you to tell anybody, right, and if they send this to me, then I don't even, you know, bother, right, it's like, so I think the new rule is share as much as you can because people will tell you, will help you. Uh, um, and will criticize you. If everybody tells you you will fail, then probably do it anyway. Uh, but uh, so another one, quickly, someone did it already. You know, it's like, of course, somebody, somebody is probably doing it. There are no revolutionary ideas. It's only execution. So if somebody did it, it's not the reason. You will always find something. Uh, focus on market research um, and, and, and don't execute. I think the best market research right now is better. Why do we have in those Web 2.0 trends Everything is better because we try things, we do them with the customers rather than being secretly, secretly in a room doing market research and trying to invent something that doesn't uh, exist. We experiment. I mean, look at Flickr, you look at YouTube. They start with the customers, they improve it, they accept openly criticism, and they, they do it in beta. It's very, very different. Then uh, plan a huge marketing. Look at YouTube, word of mouth only. So if you get the beta version right, like Gmail did, then you get the users, right? Um, I will not go through all of them, but like, don't talk to your competitors. I hear that all the time. Like, criticize your competitors, which is a big difference with politics, by the way. In politics, you have to... I was struck by that. I was on a panel with a, a socialist friend, and he had to criticize me or somebody from another party. He had to do that, and like, we cannot agree. Whereas I think it's like very different today. We have to you know, talk to, all the comp to everybody and, and, and learn from everybody's mistakes. Um, and Niklas said the, the other, so I'll stop here, but like, try to focus on making money for yourself is a sure way to fail. And I, I know a few entrepreneurs, unfortunately, they, who did that mistake. They, they tried to get rich as a focus, right? Rather than trying to change the world, as Nick has uh, pointed out. So, okay. so here are a few you see, uh, Super. Uh, which, which are very obvious. OK, I guess I'll have to refine my pitch <laughs> after hearing this. Oh, and talk to VCs. Talk like to this. VCs. <laughs> Is that Dan? Yeah. Well, that's fine. That's OK. Fine. Um, Mark, speaking of VCs, welcome to the club, Mark. To the dark side? Well, that's right. So um, my story is a wee story. We are three brothers. Um, and we always dreamed of starting a company together when we were 12, 14, and 16. 
I have two younger brothers. And uh, our problem was that we wanted first to be an entrepreneur and then had to find an idea and a product on, on which we could start our company. So it was in 98 when we all were ready uh, right out after university. And um, we said where to go and where to find our idea. And we, we basically took the next plane and went to Silicon Valley and worked there as interns in various startup companies, spent the evenings in Stanford Business School and Stanford Engineering School, listening to people like Steve Jobs telling the graduates at Stanford Business School, forget investment banking, forget consulting, go to Europe and find love, which meant for us, go to the US and find your idea and start it back in Europe, which uh, then turned out to be the eBay idea. And um, in 98, late 98, uh, we, of course, like many of us, didn't realize the magnitude of eBay's business model. They just had gone IPO, but it was one of many, many ideas the Valley talked about. And so we went back in January 99, didn't have a clue where to get the programmers, the IT people to program the technology, didn't have a clue where to get the money to start the company, didn't have a clue where to find uh, people so, to, to start the company. So bit by bit it came together. And uh, in uh, February 7, we started it, our online auction platform. We competed it with big companies like Bertelsmann and Metro, uh, which is a big German retailer. And everyone told us, you know, you have no chance. They will crush you. Their budget is much bigger. And um, we said, well, we just go for it. If we don't manage to succeed, we will close it down in six months. We try to, to not lose too much money, but we give it a shot. What can we lose? We have good education, so probably we get a proper job afterwards. And... Um, we just tried. So we went for it. We became market leader within three months because we sold our own toys. We had liquidity on the market from day one. So my roller skates and my brother's bicycles and CDs were on the platform from day one. And um, others, of course, like the big managers from big corporations don't do such stuff. So we were market leaders. And then eBay came and, you know, Pio Media, the founder of eBay, he obviously was our big hero from the Silicon Valley times. And Three months into the game, right out of university, if then someone writes you a big check, you probably say yes. Well, we said yes, and it probably was uh, one of the biggest mistakes because eBay by now is the largest international marketplace. Sorry, eBay Germany is the largest international marketplace for eBay, probably worth 10 billion by now. Some people say it's bigger than Amazon worldwide. We then let eBay Germany um, uh, for another year, uh, went into new countries. And then uh, said, we, we're entrepreneurs, we want to start something new. So we thought, what are the big trends? And at that time, early 2000, it was broadband, the rise of broad broadband and the rise of wireless. We just had the UMTS auction, the 3G auctions in Germany and the UK, where in Germany, the big carriers, the big telecom operators paid 100, million Deutschmark, 100 billion Deutschmark. So we thought, you know, those guys, those big corporate guys, they probably don't know how to to fill the big pipe, how to create content for the cell phone. So we said, why don't we try it? And we uh, partnered with big German and now European uh, electronic retailers and wanted to build the Yahoo for the cell phone. And it uh, quickly turned out that people don't care about weather or, self, uh, or stock prices or sports news on the cell phone because you have that everywhere. You have it in the newspaper, on the radio, on TV, on the fixed line, internet. You don't need that on the cell phone. Maybe if you're on the road once a year, but you don't need it regularly. But there was one thing which caught our attention, and there, that were silly ringtones. Beep, beep, beep. Really horrible noise. Uh, no one liked it. We were just grown out of the target group, which is probably 16 to 24. And um, there were also these gray and green pictures. No one could really recognize what it meant. Is it a face or is it a character? And we said, well, people are willing to pay money for this kind of little entertainment, and it only works on cell phones. It doesn't work on a PC. It doesn't work on a, on a TV. So we focused on this because we had the vision, and vision is probably too big a word, but we, we kind of saw that eventually it would turn into a, a real music file, and it would be um, the real MP3 or even MP4 quality, and it would be, with the pictures, it would be high-resolution colored screens. So... For us, it was kind of obvious that down the road, there would be more high-quality high entertainment. And um, so we said, let's go for it. And um, 
Then um, we had this big discussions with the music labels, and you all know uh, they are greedy. So they wanted the second you tell them that you make money with their stuff, they want basically all of it, and you probably have to pay on top of it. So we always said, you know, we're not making a lot of money, we're not profitable, we're still building the business. So they gave us uh, okay rates. But we then thought, why not, why not try, since we lived in Berlin, and Berlin is probably one of the creative cities in Europe right now because there's cheap living space and many artists come to, Europe, uh, to Berlin, we said, why not try to create our own ringtones? So I am happy to bring to you the original Crazy Frog, not localized to U.S. standard, not censored. So we didn't <laughs> cut off a little thing which happened in the U.S., which we had to. And please show them uh, the movie in case someone has forgotten how it looks like. <coughs> oh, what's going on? No, So, so two remarks, uh, short remarks on, on the Crazy Frog. The Crazy Frog was designed for two artists, young artists in Berlin. Didn't cost that much, didn't cost that much money. Uh, you see, we don't spend so much money on the, the color and the makeup of this, of this video because this is direct selling. People basically, especially young people, they switched on the TV screen because we were constantly advertising. And they use it like their internet destination site. So they switch on the TV. They don't have to wait for their father to let them use the, his computer. They just go to the TV screen, type in five times three, and then have a crazy frog on their phone. And the crazy frog became such a phenomenon that it was in the number one hit in the CD single charts in 25 countries, including the U.S., for four weeks. And uh, that showed to us that there's a lot of, uh, you can do a lot outside the traditional media and create your own content if it is targeted to a special group and to a uh, special device. Now, quick word on what we did then. We sold... Uh, I think, I think yeah. Mikesh has been kind enough to give everyone a copy of Crazy Frog. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> So, so quickly, we, we, um, we took Jamba into basically worldwide in the U.S. and uh, Russia, Asia, Australia, w which was a big surprise. We would have thought that we would have been copied for, uh, much f faster. But the good thing about video, uh, sorry, TV advertising is that many people think that TV advertising doesn't pay back. And what we did is we tested it with $10,000 and then with $100,000 and then with a million. And it's in some, at some point in 2005, we spent $70 million in one quarter on TV advertising worldwide. And just to give you a figure that ringtones by now is a serious category, a serious music category, uh, there are several hundred millions in turnover Jumbo is doing, did in 05 and is doing even more now. So Mark, let me, let me just uh, cut you off brief, briefly there because one of the things that interests me is that um, actually if you look at the mobile space for, for investing, there are very few consumer mobile successes. Right. I mean, you know, Martin, you invented callback back in the 90s, but you haven't done any mobile actual play since then. You haven't created a mobile-related play since then. Um, so I would love to get your thoughts on that. All of you are passionate about the Internet. All of you are looking for big opportunities. Jamba was a great success, um, but we don't see many out there. Why is that? Well, I... I think that what we're doing at Fawn is, if it's not mobile, it's nomadic. Let's say we built the largest Wi-Fi network in the world in a year, and we're adding like 20,000 hotspots a month, which is the size of T-Mobile Wi-Fi. But T-Mobile has Wi-Fi, and it has mobile, right? And we only have Wi-Fi. Why? Because there's an international scam that's called GSM licenses, and, and, and if you have them, you're part of it, and if you don't have them, you're left out, and that's why there hasn't been so much, you know, so many new things going on. But now there's Wi-Fi 802.11n, there's WiMAX, there's uh, parts of the spectrum that haven't begun out. So in terms of telecom, I think finally the game is opening up. And in terms of content, I, I would disagree with you, Danny, because I think there's been a lot of good stuff uh, that's been created. And certainly, Jamba is an example of uh, 
an incredible new category that who would have guessed that people would have you know, paid fortunes for that silly frog, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Louis, can you thoughts? Uh, yeah, no, I think it's, uh, uh, the main reason is the standard. There is no standard with the mm -hmm. phones. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have to port uh, uh, a web application to a phone, you need to translate it into how many systems you have. You have Symbian, then you have a BlackBerry, you have, you know, it's, it's just too many. Yeah. On the web, you just do one, and I think that's the main reason. It's terrible when you mm -hmm. want to mm -hmm. have a service there, except ringtones, right? Yeah, <laughs> I think uh, the screen is just too small. It's just not fun to do much on those small screens and even them getting a little bit bigger. It's just so difficult to do serious, entertaining stuff on it. And, um, and then also, as Martin said, you're, you're, you're walking in a walled garden. You always need the operator to work with you if you want to do something which is integrated into the network and really interesting. Even presence, you have to, to work with the operator. And with a fixed line internet, it's so much easier. You just plug in your server, you, you start, you program your site, you, you put it up, and then the world can see it. So we have not seen until today something besides ringtones and maybe video as the next generation of um, pictures which has really caught attention in that space. GPS is bring, probably bringing, I, I just saw yesterday the, the Nokia phone, the N95 with GPS built in, and then Nokia is, um, having, is providing this great um, location software, these great maps, etc. That is going to be a serious service which is going to be used. But I think in the end, we all like to use the internet either, or the online, either very efficient and then the screen again is too small, and all we would like to be entertained. And then again, the screen is too small, the capacity is not big enough, plus you have yeah. to work with big guys. I mean, what's also interesting them. is that the N95 was supposed to ship with Wi-Fi, and most operators have shut down the yeah. Wi-Fi capability. Yeah. So it's surprisingly, there are 110,000 phones in the UK, contraband, that have Wi-Fi functionality, but there are millions that are out there that should have shipped with that and don't. Um, so it's going to be an interesting sort of uh, ch challenge and battle that goes on between, between the openness of Wi-Fi and the closed, the closed system of, of GSM. And I also think there's, there was and is still too much um, hope for location-based services. I mean, who of us wants to walk down High Street and get a message every second, you know, come, in, come into McDonald's, you get a burger free, and come into... Marks and Spencers, and you get a sandwich free, and you know it, you just don't want it. Yeah. But that's a big trend on mobile, uh, which is happening, uh, which is microblogging. So, how many of you know Twitter? Yeah, well, okay, so you know Twitter. No, so I think <laughs> everybody. So no, it's it's a very big trend, very interesting that you were mentioning. Okay, close to this, get close to this shop, and you get an advertising message. But in this case, it's us telling the world. Uh, what we're doing. Like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to lunch, and I'm back from lunch. Very interesting. I, I, you know, it's like <laughs> useless, pointless. But I, so like on my Twitter, I have like more than 500 followers. And what I send them as a message is, why do you read this? Because <laughs> it's like, so this is a very weird trend, which is interesting. And I think we see the web and the mobile merging through those mm -hmm. instantaneous communications. Like email is getting a lot broken. Thanks to Gmail, it's better. But because we all have too many. So here it's like, grab me now or, or never, right? Yeah. So it's a very interesting trend, which I think are making the both converging. OK, if I could ask the three of you to, to join the stage. And, and while uh, the three of them join, anyone uh, who wants to ask a question, it'd be great if you could either stand up or, or go to the microphone stand. Uh, there's a question right here. So uh, especially with Danny here on stage. What is the role of the VC? How oh. important has it been for you <laughs> to pick the right one or wrong one? And how much time should serial entrepreneurs spend on that? Now we're moderating I, you. I'll, vol <laughs> I'll, oh, volunteer, I'll volunteer this. I, I think probably maybe I'm the one who's raised mo the most money from the most diverse group of VCs, APAX, Advent, since like the early 90s. And Dan is one of a kind. I'd like to say that <laughs> he's very good. And uh, but I'll use I'll I'll, no, I'll real, explain. No, 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 no. He's the real home. one. Okay. It's the real one. You know, I don't bullshit. The, the GSM <laughs> operators are a scam, and he's the the right thing. <laughs> but but I'll 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 say why. And it's not just Dan. It's there's a group of issues like that. Very few, but there are. There's some who say, okay. 
um, sort of the panspermia theory of life. You know, you throw your sperm everywhere, <laughs> and uh, some somewhere you may life may spring. You know, <laughs> and I've had previous previous VCs who endorsed the panspermia theory of life. Uh, I say this because I don't know if Mark Shuttleworth is here, but he reminded me of that theory yesterday. I thought it was very interesting. Not applied to VCs though, but. <laughs> There's the nurturing VCs, the VCs who are there and, and are helping you, are bringing you contacts, are giving you ideas, nurturing. So I, my advice to anyone who's starting a business is really interview your VC like the people, like Eric says, he interviews, Google interviews people with the LAX, LAX theory that six hours at an airport stuck with them. Okay, I think you're six hours at an airport stuck with your VC. Could you survive? Would you hate him? I think that's applicable. I'm very good at collecting <laughs> coffee, getting you Jamba Juice in the LAX. <laughs> that's the value add. You, you guys, if you if you I think the most important point give color. that is why VCs still are interesting and, and matter to serial entrepreneurs because I mean, let's be, let's face it, we all have been there. We've done it. We know what the challenges are. We could do it alone. We don't need a helping hand, which is certainly different when you do it the first time. Why serial entrepreneurs still need a very good VCs like you, Danny. Um, and there are very few in Europe, and there are actually also very few in the U.S., if, you, if you're honest. Um, <coughs> you just must make sure that he really understands your business and that he really is a sparing partner. And that is the original idea of a VC, because there, all the VCs' money is green, okay? Everyone has money to, nowadays, and it's not about who gives you the most money. It's really who you can talk with about your business and who really helps you. Because as an entrepreneur, you are alone. I have the luck to have two brothers. Nicholas has the luck to have Janice. But if you are, you're still you're alone, even if you're two or three people, and you must make serious decisions and important decisions with basically no information at all, which, whether to go right or left. And if you then have a serious sparing partner who has seen many other businesses, many businesses in that kind of, with that kind of important decisions, um, then it's great. That is exactly the guy you need because there's no one else who can, who can help you. Of course, you have friends, and of course, today I could call Martin and Luik and Nicholas and, and ask, but they probably will say, no, I have my own stuff. Leave me alone. But if he is invested in my business, he is interested, and if then he's good, he probably will help me. Yeah. Can I, can I ask Please. you a question? I mean, how do you deal with the problem that most money are now chasing buyouts rather than early-stage investments? I mean, the asset class is shifting. It's away from early stage investments into buying boots and buying TDC and that sort of size of deal. I'm even very bigger. thankful of that. I'm very thankful. So you're one of a shrinking. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we have, you know, minute funds of 300 million euros to put mm. to work, which, uh, which really in relative terms, especially in Europe, um, is very small. So what it means is that, uh, you know, thankfully, and, and this has been sort of the idea of, of Index, but of a number of other firms, that the level of innovation that goes on in Europe is totally disconnected with the amount of venture capital that actually is injected to, to back entrepreneurs. So in relative terms to the US, for instance, where $25 billion is put to work in venture-backed companies every year, it's less than $4 billion in Europe. When did you raise your fund? The could, you, could you raise it again? That's my question. In other words. Yeah, so, so, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, I hope weeks, so. Right? Yeah, no, the last, one, the last one took three weeks. And, we, and, when and was actually, it, when was it, it? was uh, in April okay. or March. Okay, so it's still open. Um, and, the, and actually, the notion that we kept was, you know, let's keep it small, let's stick to our knitting and continue doing what we're doing. But it is going to be very interesting to see, uh, to see what happens, not only on the private equity side, but actually, you know, uh, Probably the majority of you are tending to make a number of investments uh, on your own uh, in, and, and acting as angels slash VCs. Um, in the case of markets, you know, very, very obvious that he and his brothers are doing that. But um, yeah, you're competing, right? But, but one I thing so. I wanted to say is that Google said yesterday publicly to all of us that close to half of the profits they make come from Europe. Uh, which means that we make the Silicon Valley company so wealthy and successful, we are responsible for half of their market cap. I think it's time we fund our own companies, and some of that market cap stays in Europe. I agree with that. Here, here. Um, so, any well, any other question in in the audience? Please. 
Uh, you mentioned when you were talking that when you start up a business, one of the big issues is there's a lot of big competitors or big companies already in those spaces. But you look at online for the past four or five, maybe six years, the successes have not come from established companies. They've all come from companies that have started up from next to nothing. Why do you think that's been the case? And do you think that sets to continue as well? I, I can answer uh, that. Yeah, I can answer that. So, my theory is that it's, you're much better off starting with a blank sheet of paper than a big balance sheet and, and revenues and customers and market share. Because what happens now is that there's so much new, the new technology and the internet are enabling you to do things, this, uh, solve an old problem completely different ways. And, and that usually means that it's much, much cheaper. It's very difficult to be an established company, establish revenue streams to just disrupt yourself. I go to the, you know, if you're the CEO for a public company, go to the, you know, to your board, say, oh, by the way, we're going to like um, completely just disrupt ourselves, and uh, we're going to have a big um, decrease for a few years or a year or so in our revenues. It's very, very difficult. So you have all these different um, constraints as an established company, and what happens today? The infrastructure, the internet infrastructure, is so amazing because you can. Not only can you use, like, if you have a great idea, and Skype was a very good example of that, and, you know, YouTube was also a good example if you have many others. If you have something which is great and you just put it out on the Internet, people just discover it, and you don't need to have this massive amount of marketing. In the old days, it was all about building up a sales and marketing infrastructure, um, advertising your services, getting into retail. You don't need to do these things anymore. And also with the, all this thing we talk about Web 2.0 is that, a lot of building blocks are already there. So when you innovate, you can innovate on top of others, other, other technologies. So it's actually a very light weight to produce new, new services. So if we could just have uh, the slides that I, that I prepared, um, because you know, we're, we're now on to the topic of Web 2.0, and we're on to the topic of, as you are saw in the- Are introduce Web 3.0? Uh, web 3.0, it starts here. <laughs> Actually, no. I think that Loic started it last year. If we could, if we could have the slides, that'd be great. Um, we also saw that in that introductory uh, video. Um, what I wanted to focus on, hopefully, uh, is sort of the, uh, the fact that when you think about Web 2.0, uh, and actually Valleywag helped us with this, which is basically the Wall Street Journal of, of, uh, of the Internet, what you realize is that with Web 2.0, the entrepreneurs and successful entrepreneurs are getting younger and younger. So, uh, Nicholas, you're very aging in this whole context. And if we go to the next slide. That's what slide, I had a tie yesterday. That's right. Uh, no, of course. Well, you're 25, <laughs> is my understanding. If we go to the next slide, um, this, is, this is actually Valleywag's, uh, mostly Valleywag's information. Stelios, I believe you started EasyJet when you're 28. 28, yeah. Um, Jim Clark has had quite a bit of success um, as he's gotten older, although I think that he hit the jackpot at 50. And Shutterfly, I don't think he would call a success at this point, but he's, he's too busy sailing in any case. Um, but the point, and if you see it on the next slide, I've actually done a visual, really showing you what I can do, just like that guy yesterday, the Swede, I can do slides too. Okay, that's it. We can, we can take that one away. Thank you very much for showing them. But I did, want it to, I, I did want to bring up the point about how do you continue to be entrepreneurial? Um, how do you deal with the fact that there's some young punk who's actually making money on poker in his dorm room and starting a business uh, that, is, that is looking at what you guys have done as success and want to take over what, what, what you have successfully done, in fact. Stelios, you start. It, it, it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's it? The, yeah, the next innovation in travel is going to come from another 28-year-old, yeah. not me, <laughs> probably. <laughs> you know, public companies, the earlier question was, why don't you know, great innovative ideas, disruptive ideas come from public companies. Um, I have a bit of experience sitting on board of two public companies I created, and the whole system is designed to preserve money, not to go and risk it. And you're supposed to focus, and you're supposed to only do what you're supposed to be doing. Otherwise, shareholders get very upset. And it's only during bubble years that you're allowed to go out and diversify, and you know, exceptionally companies are allowed to invest in, 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 in an adjacent sector. And sometimes, you know, um, we, we get catastrophic results as well, and run. <laughs> you know, so at the end of the day, I think it is the next 28-year-old that's going to come up with the next idea because you know, we can't afford the time and you know, we have to preserve what we have. It's, it's jungle, isn't it? 
So <laughs> it is a survival. <laughs> I, I think that we're, yeah. we're all too um, used yeah. to this new starting up businesses every 10 seconds. And if you think about some of the, our favorite brands in the world, like Coca-Cola, or um, what we were talking about yesterday um, in the advertising space, um, do not forget the power of your brand and the relationship with your customer. Um, sure, people are going to come up and try and copy you and do what you're doing. But if you focus on that end user and on what you're good at and what um, uh, the relationship you have with your users, as long as you're converting them to come back yet, yet time and again, and for them to tell their friends to come back, you can build a long-term brand. I don't think that we should be thinking in such short-term um, basis. But brands get built overnight. I mean, you know, Martin was saying this yesterday that Google is the most popular brand or the most valuable brand in the world. And I'd be curious to know how much Google has actually spent on marketing in its first three, four years to build that brand. So we have such an amazing um, service from them. That's right. That's right. Martin, any thoughts on the youth side? No, I, Your I kids think, are going to run fun? I think, yeah, no, I, I think the, the it's you. It also depends on the rivals you pick and the fight that you pick and the environment <coughs> in which you move in. Uh, but I have had experiences like building Ya.com where the demographic was 16 to 25, and by then I was 39 when I started it. And I think it's an issue. Can you connect to your demographics more than... Why wasn't Yellowcom started by people in that demographic? So we did these ads where we had people pissing on TV and saying Yellowcom, and everybody hated those ads, but our demographics, they love those ads. They like the idea of pissing on TV. And I think that, uh, which was a subliminal I think you have message, a go, go to on the YouTube. internet. You yeah. have a turtle one we, on we, Yeah, the turtle ones. Yeah, we had those turtles you know, having sex. And it was, it was, so the question is, how do you reach your demographics, not how old are you? Can you connect to the people who you are talking to? And I guess uh, Redstone, you know, I don't know if the guy is still running Viacom, last, uh, I was checking. <laughs> but I mean, you can have guys in the 80s reaching kids in, who are teens. So the question is, can you connect to your demographics? Yeah. I think we have time for one or two last questions. Otherwise, you guys are probably all hungry. I would like to thank our fantastic panel. Um, so um, there's, there's an hour break where you're supposed to catch lunch, and we start promptly um, after an hour, so I guess 2.15, uh, with Jonathan Citrain's um, panel, which is all about digital youth culture, which should be fascinating, in fact. Thank you. <laughs>